Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for the um, 2023 EPIC Conference, Balancing the Scales, Fostering Mental Health Awareness in the Law. I'm Corey Hirakawa. I have recently joined Emory Law's Center for Public Service, and I'm serving as the EPIC advisor and have the great honor of being able to work with these amazing students um, as they've put together this conference today. Um, I'm sure we all are aware that mental health concerns and crises and issues have been unfortunately surging in all different ways in our communities over the last several years. Um, and at the same time, we in the legal profession um, face, as I'm sure we're also aware, higher levels of depression and anxiety, substance abuse, suicide, um, higher levels of mental challenges than um, those in many other professions. Um, it's maybe comes as no surprise. We work in what can be a very stressful and demanding profession. Um, and at the same time, we're also called on to be able to address the mental health needs of our clients in ways that are empathetic and appropriate and allow us to provide effective counsel across a whole spectrum of needs. Um, all of those challenges make the topic for today's conference incredibly timely and incredibly important. Um, our um, student chairs for the conference, Elizabeth Bryan and Claudia Cornelison, have been really hard at work all summer and fall to put together this amazing roster of speakers. And I'd like you all to join me in thanking them for putting this together for us today. Thank you. They've done a fabulous job, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to them. Good morning. Uh, my name is Claudia Cornelison. I'm joined with Elizabeth Bryant, and we are so excited to welcome you this year. The inspiration behind this event comes from a deficit in our legal education. While we learn how to think and write like lawyers, to make compelling arguments and analyze case law, we don't learn how the law actually touches real human beings and how we can best serve them. Mental illness is a problem that many of our clients face, and oftentimes our legal education leaves us without adequate tools for client care. Beyond that, it has become expected at this point that the legal profession is rife with mental illness. Lawyers are expected to be stressed. We're expected to be burnt out. And we're expected to be potential substance abusers in the future. We joke about it, and meanwhile, we tacitly accept the status quo. But just because something is what it is now doesn't mean it always has to be. Today, we have a group of speakers who will identify where we are now with mental health and the law and propose a new way forward for our clients and for ourselves. We hope this information will be one step toward making the world a little kinder, softer, more understanding, and more just. And with that, we are thrilled to welcome you to the 2023 Emory Public Interest Committee Conference, Balancing the Scales, Fostering Mental Health Awareness in the Law. First up, we have Derek Johnson Gage presenting on the criminalization of mental illness. Derek Johnson Gage is a 2003 graduate of Emory University School of Law began his career in the DeKalb County Public Defender, where he helped create the mental health unit to represent defendants struggling with their mental health. In 2011, he started his own practice, the Gage Law Firm, where he continued his focus on criminal cases where mental illness played a pervasive role in his advocacy. Currently, Mr. Johnson Gage continues to manage his practice and teaches the competency and criminal responsibility practicum at Emory University School of Law aimed at educating students on both the law and practical considerations of criminal litigation involving mental illness. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Mr. Derek Johnson Gage. Thank you, Claudia, Elizabeth, for having me. I much appreciate it. Uh, Y'all, forgive me in advance if I'm not as linear as normal. My three-year-old has given me a lovely cold, so I'm in a little bit of a NyQuil cloud, but I'm going to try to push through it as best I can. Claudia, you said something super important that is really kind of the core of my message here, and that is that this touches on individuals, 
and I really hate cliches. I think they taglines serve as a rallying cry, but I think they also kind of invite lazy analysis of the problem. And what we're dealing with here is not just a lack of funding or a lack of beds. You're talking about individuals and you need to get down on the ground level if you're gonna attack this issue effectively. So I'm not gonna talk a lot about what's actually happening in the criminal justice system because I think it's really a consequence of what's happening outside of it. It's a manifestation of failures that we have elsewhere in the system and there's just not a lot of energy needed on focusing what's happening actually in the criminal justice system but rather what's happening before you ever get there. And as I see it, there's basically three issues that we're dealing with here. One is kind of a reverse of the old axiom, can't see the forest for the trees. It's backwards. We can't see the trees for the forest because we don't focus enough on the individual wrestling with these challenges. And secondly, crisis hospitalization is in crisis, both in the state system and in the private system. And it lends itself to a compounding of issues that ultimately lead to folks getting into the criminal justice system who wrestle with these challenges. And third, there are, here in Georgia at least and elsewhere in other states, statutes in place that allow for judicial intervention on an outpatient basis, but they are very much underutilized, especially here. And I think building those potential mechanisms up can be a part of the solution of, of bringing folks out of the criminal justice system. So when I'm talking about not seeing the trees for the forest, I'm, the, the core component of this is a lack of humility. And I mean that both when we're speaking on the issue and when we're treating it. This idea that we somehow know more about what it's like to have schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, severe anxiety, and that we can somehow preach to the person who actually has it, kind of manifests itself in this air of condescension. And I can speak to that personally. I have a mama with schizophrenia, I grew up around it. When you speak to somebody who has these conditions in that way, the end result is inevitably every single time that they tune you out. They are not interested in talking with you about their mental health anymore. Ooh, nice. I thought I was loud already. They don't want to rely on you as a means of support because you are talking to them as if they were a child. And that's exactly how my mother described it to me. And so what I, the, the idea, or at least the premise that I've come to over the course of 20 something years of practice and, and a lot longer being around somebody with these challenges and, and dealing with them myself is to get rid of this notion that I think a lot of people both in mainstream psychiatry and elsewhere have that a person wrestling with these issues has to somehow accept that they have an illness or accept that they're sick before they can really do anything to improve the situation for themselves. Is it really important that a person does this? Or is it more important, and I would posit, that the person simply commits to understanding how their mind works? And that kind of underscores the idea of being humble in this process, you know, recognizing that we don't know what it's like to have these conditions. We really don't know what causes them. And so why do we have to label them an illness? just because the person's unhappy, just because the person might be homeless, just because the person has lost contact with their family, it feeds into a stigma that really kind of underscores the fact that we don't know what we're talking about. One of the things I like to do when I speak on this subject is to basically take a, I usually bring like a, a Pepsi AC, I don't tell anybody what it is, put it in front of a person and ask them if they would take the pill just because I asked. And obviously and understandably, the answer is always no. 
You're not going to take a medicine that's just put in front of you without any other explanation. And I usually try to layer on top of it. What if I were to tell you it is, the scientific name for it is famotidine. Is that enough information for you to take the pill? And the answer is always no. And what if I go on to say that famotidine is the equivalent of Pepsid-AC and it's meant to treat heartburn. It's an H2 blocker. It prevents acid from coming up into your esophagus. Would you take it then? And typically the answer is no, because I don't have heartburn. And this is, on a much grander scale, what folks dealing with these challenges have to face on a regular basis, especially in the crisis hospitalization system. It is medications put in front of them, no questions asked, take it, you'll get better, stay on it, and you'll stay better. And that notion does not jibe with folks dealing with this issue and with the idea that they have sanctity over their body. So, just take a look at a couple of these medications. Olanzapine, Zyprexa is a mood stabilizer, antipsychotic, oftentimes prescribed for bipolar one, schizoaffective. The FDA claims side effects of weight gain, dizziness, akathisia, which is this inability to stay still. And I have seen this over and over with clients who take it. The mechanism of action per the FDA, as with other drugs having efficacy in schizophrenia, is unknown. However, they have many theories on how it might potentially work. And there are a ton of studies on how this might actually affect the symptom of schizophrenia. The mechanism of action of olanzapine in the treatment of acute manic episodes, as in bipolar one, is unknown. Seroquel, the mechanism of action as far as treatment of schizophrenia and acute manic episodes is unknown. Haloperidol, Haldol, which is a first generation antipsychotic. Side effects, and these I have seen, they are tragic. If you've ever seen anybody on a high level of Haldol, tardive dyskinesia is almost a guarantee. It is severe shaking that doesn't go away when you stop taking it. Drooling, cardiovascular effects, and the precise mechanism of action has not been clearly established. This is over and over and over again in every medication that you see because we don't know how they work because we don't really understand exactly how the conditions manifest. And yet, we're telling people that you need to take this without asking questions. I know better than you. This is going to treat it. That lack of humility is a huge roadblock and fosters um, a desire to stay away from treatment. It, it is really the seed of it. Secondly is this desire and need for control. So the hospitalization framework, which is, exist, exists in every state, is basically the only area of law outside of perhaps civil contempt, which kind of suggests a person is, is taking a volitional act. It's really the only area of civil law where it justifies the restraint of liberty of an individual. And unlike other health conditions, there is this notion that has been created that the person wrestling with these challenges has a responsibility to the rest of us to treat it. And what I think that does is kind of create this atmosphere, it lends itself to this idea that we need to impose control, whether it's via staff at a hospital or whether it's through the court system. And that obviously conflicts with the desire of every person in this room, which is to have control over their own body, to have control over their lives, what they do, where they work, what makes them happy. And ultimately, that cloud leads to this resentment and apathy towards what might otherwise be potentially beneficial treatment. And the more we try to impose that control over individuals wrestling with these acute symptoms, the less control we ultimately have. 
and it takes me back to a professor when I was at Maryland studying political science, and this has always stuck with me, and he spent an entire class talking about the difference between authority and power. We in the legal system rely on authority regularly. A judge's signature on a guardian, guardianship order. A judge's signature on an order to apprehend, to take somebody to a hospital. That is authority over another human being. Power over that person, or power from that person only comes from the individual when they're willing to buy in to whatever you're trying to sell them. And the law does not really give us power. What gives us power is getting down on ground level and trying to come to some understanding of what these folks are dealing with. And then you can effectively play the role that I think we have as lawyers, as family members, which is essentially to guide somebody who has very limited insight to a treatment structure where they can actually start receiving some meaningful help. There is, and this is one of the most frustrating parts of my career, an obsession with medication compliance in every corner and every aspect of this issue, whether it's from treatment, whether it is in hospitalization, whether it's in the court system, even in some more novel concepts of trying to utilize the criminal court system to the benefit of those wrestling with these challenges, it's this idea that we have to make sure they're taking their medicines. <clears throat> when I was early on in my career, I approached this issue with my clients the same way that I did with my mom. Every time she went off her medications, I lost it. And I would run through this litany of, you know, you know what happens. Every time this happens, you go into crisis. You're going to end up back in the hospital. Um, I don't know why you're doing it this way. You know, you know these medications make you better. Why aren't you taking them? And like I said, she ultimately just stopped listening to me. I couldn't talk with her about her mental health at all. And I tried to utilize that same approach with my clients, and it all came out of a place of ignorance across the board. I had not done any education, tried to understand the nature of these conditions, tried to understand what it's like to even take these medications, and that message was received on the other side as a message of ignorance from somebody who actually had to take them. We have to accept that these folks have sovereignty over their body period. You will never be in a place where you can ensure that a person doesn't want to take medications, and that's okay. That's another thing that I had to come to accept. At any point along the timeline, a person who is in this situation and who has taken medications in the past is going to have a crisis of faith when it comes to their doctors, their medications, the pharmaceutical companies. It's going to happen. And that decision may ultimately result in them deciding they don't want to take medications at all. The medication-centric view of mental health treatment, in my experience, is a fingernails approach to treatment. Because ultimately, if that's the only focus, and inevitably that person is going to challenge whether they need to be taking medications at all for various reasons, and you've got nothing underneath it. There is no safety net. It is an immediate de-evolution into crisis. And so the focus, in my opinion, needs to be placed more on, or what needs to be number one priority, is strengthening the structure of mental health professionals and the support from family and friends. And this is what I used to say to her was, or, or how ultimately I, I changed my approach with her was, look, if you have a strong structure around you, if you are working with professionals who you trust, doctors you trust, therapists you trust, psychologists, if you have family who has worked to understand this themselves, 
and you decide, I want to give this a go without medications, you are far less likely to fall into crisis because you have people you trust who can point out that things aren't necessarily going the way that you want. Then you tie back into them, then you talk about potentially getting back on meds, changing medication dosages, whatever, but you have that structure around you. And by putting medication compliance, secondly, you have a safety net in the event that the person decides that they don't want to take them. And then lastly is what I think I've been alluding to all along, which is a failure to empathize with the folks wrestling with these challenges. And I call folks in our position, everybody in this room, as lawyers or as family members, basically the front lines. We are not treatment. We don't have the degrees or the education, nor do we have um, the foundation to provide treatment for them. But we are the ones guiding them from the dark to folks who can help them. And the only way that we do that is by gaining power. And where does power come from? The person you're trying to help. They give it to you. And the only way you gain that power is by trying to understand what they are dealing with. What is it like to have auditory hallucinations, to have visu visual hallucinations? What is it like to have grandiose delusions? What is it like to be in a state of mania and frankly, the discussions, the conversations I've had with clients are fascinating. It is fascinating to have a person articulate what it's like to wrestle with these conditions. You have to understand what it's like to take medications. I'm not talking about looking at the DSM-5. I'm not talking about buying into whatever the pharmaceutical companies put on a website. Dig into the scientific evidence. What is the mechanism of action? And moreover, anecdotal stories. What are people saying it feels like? One description of mood stabilizers, Depakote, Cyprexa, I've heard over and over and over again, is that it feels like a blanket on your brain. And this is a blanket over a brain that is operating at a level that we can't comprehend. And that is a concession that they have to accept. So, by coming to the place where I was talking to people and trying to understand what it felt like, it put me in a position when I was speaking on medications that my message was able to be received a lot easier because they knew I had at least tried to understand what it was like from their side. And that is just so key to keeping people out of a crisis situation, to keeping people out of the criminal justice system. You got to know what it's like to absorb the stigma as well. The words, even words we use as folks trying to help are stigmatized. And so I am constantly reviewing my lexicon, how I speak with my clients, because you can get a wall thrown up super easy. I don't use the word illness really at all. It's, it, they are challenges. There are so many commonalities I see that lend itself to this idea, and some people would call it romantic, but these folks are all highly intelligent. We think circles around them almost always highly empathetic and always highly intuitive. They can always figure out where I'm going with a thought before I ever get there. And looking at it that way, pent up, untapped, latent potential is a much more positive way of approaching it with the folks actually wrestling with these challenges. How am I doing on that? Not bad. Okay. All right, I have a disclaimer. Not a lot, not a lot. Maybe more people than I give myself credit for. Many people would disagree with me when it comes to my analysis, especially of the private hospital system. I'm not asking you to buy into my cynicism. It has been built up over the course of a lot of years. I just want you to open your mind to the idea that the laws that exist lends itself to abuse. And that abuse has potential catastrophic consequences on people wrestling with mental health challenges. So one of the common 
or four of the common refrains, cliched refrains, in my opinion, that I hear a lot. Individuals need to be in a hospital, not a jail. We need more inpatient beds. It needs to be easier to hospitalize someone in crisis and deinstitutionalization, whatever that means, led to an influx of the mentally ill in jails and prisons. This is not the core necessarily of what led to deinstitutionalization. It is oftentimes pointed to as a culprit. There are a lot of things over the course of a lot of decades that led to a reanalysis of inpatient hospitalization. But O'Connor v. Donaldson and Addington v. Texas are the two Supreme Court cases in the late 70s that are typically cited to when it comes to deinstitutionalization. And O'Connor, in 1975, basically laid the groundwork for the idea that a state cannot constitutionally confine, I'm just pulling from the case itself, without more, a non-dangerous individual who is capable of surviving safely in freedom by himself or with the help of willing and responsible family members or friends. And since the jury found upon ample evidence that petitioner did so confine respondent, it properly concluded that petitioner had violated respondent's right to liberty. So the core of it and the idea from a factual pattern in this case is that they were essentially concerned about what was going to happen to this guy when he went out of the hospital wanted to make sure that he had adequate resources. They didn't think that was going to be possible. And so, you know, they're, the way they put it was they were essentially trying to protect this person from harm. And what o the O'Connor court essentially said is that we are going to prioritize the liberty interest of an individual, whether it be in the criminal context or whether it be in the civil context, and that there has to be a basis to hold somebody against their will, and they essentially um, laid the groundwork for what has become you know, typical language in every state when it comes to involuntary hospitalization. Addison laid the groundwork for a burden of proof. So they essentially said that preponderance is not enough. On the other side, beyond a reasonable doubt, is too much. That the middle road of a clear and convincing standard of proof is required under equal protection in a civil proceeding brought under state law to commit an individual involuntarily for an indefinite period. <clears throat> so there are many folks who I've talked to who would point to Addison O'Connor as two cases that really kind of wrecked the, the system. I don't look at it that way. I look at it as a positive. They were essentially saying, look, you can't just hold somebody because you're concerned about them. You know, prioritizing the liberty interest to me was exactly what they should have done. What it did result in, though, was this type of language. This is Georgia's criteria for involuntary inpatient admission, and really, the language is similar in most states. It is a person who presents a substantial risk of imminent harm to that person or others, as manifested by either recent overt acts or recent express threats of violence, which present a probability of physical injury to that person or other persons. And here in Georgia, like other states, uh, the paths to admission are either via the probate court, two witnesses can go in, submit an affidavit, the court can issue an order to apprehend, which is akin to a 1013. That can be issued by a provider here. The law allows for basically any psychiatric professional. In some cases, law enforcement, there was a change in the law this past year that fluffed that up a little bit. Um, that can also be a means of involuntary admission. Georgia's, Georgia Crisis Access Line and their mobile crisis units uh, can respond and typically have uh, folks who have authority to 1013 if necessary. And then there's voluntary admission to crisis stabilization units. And that can be either to a state or private. I think at this point the state is not taking voluntary admissions is how I understand it. Um, private CSUs are not 
ERs. ER is typically where you go when you have a 1013. They are hospitals like Peachford, Lakeview, Anchor, Riverwoods. They all have these nature names, but they are what the law calls evaluating facilities, what we in the profession call CSUs or crisis stabilization units. And so there is a statutory timeline that was created for involuntary admissions. And that is, and this feeds into my argument of how broken this is, I promise. Once you get to an ER on a 1013, and this is just an, any emergency re receiving facility, you know, Wellstar or I don't think Piedmont takes them, but a Grady, um, you have 48 hours on a 1013 before a doctor has to issue a 1014 certificate, which basically says, or it endorses the 1013 and says, yes, this person meets criteria for involuntary inpatient hospitalization. And once that 1014 is lodged, the ER has 24 hours to transport the person from the ER to the Peachfords of the world <clears throat> or to a state hospital. That's where you get the 72 hours that is bandied about way too much. It is a real red herring. Um, 72 hours is really just focused on the ER admission. Once a person gets to the, to the CSU, the Peachfords of the world, those hospitals have an additional five days, weekend and holidays excluded, to treat as necessary before they have to get the courts involved. And that's via what's called a 1021 petition. Once that 1021 is lodged, for whatever reason, the statute reads that the hearing, the 1052 hearing, which is where the court comes in and says, does this person really meet criteria for extended hospitalization, must happen no sooner than seven days and no later than 12 days after the 1021 is lodged. I still have not been able to divine how that came about or what it means. <clears throat> so as it stands, the state system especially post-COVID, is an unmitigated disaster. And there's just no real nice way to put it. They are so understaffed. They have such a shortage of beds, and it is a vicious cycle with them because as COVID sickened a lot of the staff, they left, found presumably higher paying jobs, safer jobs. Um, there were accreditation issues. So you have to have a certain number of staff per beds. When you lose that staff, you have to close down the beds. So you're losing staff and you're losing beds at the same time. And it has created a log jam, I guess you could call it, in the, the state civil hospital system to the point where lately, I have seen ERs illegally, I might add, just reissuing 1013s over and over and over again because folks who aren't insured can't get into the state hospitals, and yet they feel that they still meet criteria, so they just keep issuing the 1013s, and I have heard that DBHDD is endorsing this notion because they don't have beds either, so they don't know what to do other than just tell the ERs, do what you gotta do. <clears throat> so, that leaves it, or the rest of it, to the private hospital system, which, many look at as the potential savior when it comes to inpatient hospitalization. And in the wake of O'Connor and Addington in 1979, Alan B. Miller, who was in the advertising industry, he was an MBA from Wharton, founded Universal Health Services. Initially, he had had a business with another partner of private hospitals in high growth cities lost that business in a hostile takeover to Humana, and then created UHS after that takeover. And what started as four hospitals, and I think nine employees or, or nine administrative employees, ultimately grew over 40 years into 400 hospitals here in the States and in the UK. Most recent annual revenues came close to $14 billion. And in 2020, Miller's son, who is also a Wharton business grad, took over as CEO. And I would just note that Miller also sat on the boards of Penn Mutual Life and Broadlane, which is a cost containment services. That's the focus of that company. 
and of the seven members on the board of directors for Universal Health Services, and I'm just picking on UHS, there are several of these companies, UHS is the biggest, but of the seven members of the board of directors, there is one, uno, one doctor, one. And he's not a psychiatrist. He's a general practitioner, it's to my knowledge, and my research of Dr. Sussman has never really practiced in a hospital. And incidentally, he's also a Wharton business grad on top of being a general practitioner doctor. So of seven members of a board of directors of a corporation that runs inpatient psychiatric crisis stabilization hospitals, nobody is a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or has any education in mental health. So my point being is do statutory and the procedural realities invite potential abuse in the private psychiatric hospital system? And I will note that since 2008 with Obamacare and what was for good reasons trying to pump up mental health insurance coverage, this system really exploded, uh, e even more so than it had already. This is the only area of the law that authorizes private entities to legally restrain somebody's liberty. Concerns of the mentally ill are often discounted or disregarded as rantings of a crazy person, decisions left to the same decision makers, the doctors. There is no accountability. The statutes here in Georgia provide for things like a habeas corpus petition, judicial inquiry, no probate system that I have talked with really has the framework for any of that on the front end, only extended hospitalization. And the statutory timeline language invites delay, 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 in addition to immunity from liability, both in the statutes and in the case law. So what it results in is this five to seven day business model that is so consistent that whenever I talk to families about it, I don't have to qualify it. It is five to seven days every time, and they make a lot of money with it, regardless of whether a patient actually meets criteria. So in most cases, when I'm looking at these folks, they don't qualify as an imminent threat of harm. They haven't, in the hospital system, been committing any acts that would suggest they are, and yet they're being held anyways because there's no accountability. <clears throat> Staff are regularly uninformed when it comes to rights of patients, and there is a host of patient rights in the statutes in existence that are never told to patients, even though the law requires them to tell them, and never utilized. The statutory language invites delay, and real quick, just as an example, if you are a voluntary patient and you want to request discharge, you can't walk out of the hospital as a voluntary patient, you want to request discharge. If you ask for the form to do it, the hospital has 24 hours to get it to you. Once you lodge the written form, they have another 24 hours to get it to a doctor. Once the doctor gets it, the doctor has 72 hours in combination with the chief medical officer who has zero interaction with the patient to think about it as to whether the person can be discharged or whether they meet criteria for inpatient hospitalization it's inevitably discharged as the ultimate result, but what does that add up to? Five days. And by the time the person's actually asking, they already have a day or two under their belt. It all fits into this business model that sadly results in a revolving door. And ultimately, that resulted in a DOJ settlement in 2020 in which UHS forked over $122 million, really a drop in the bucket, for exactly the types of things that I'm talking about. They, of course, didn't admit fault. But what this means is that it is a traumatizing situation for folks, and it creates this idea that that is what mental health care is, and that ultimately leads to um, not engaging in real mental health treatment on an outpatient basis, um, and ultimately means more reliance on 911 and if a person gets in the criminal justice system and is in jail, then the parents are almost in a situation because they've seen the person coming in and out of the hospital so many times. Jail is a safe place. They know they can't get out. 
And so it means more control for them as opposed to this five to seven days in and out, in and out, in and out. And it just kind of beefs up uh, folks with mental illness in the criminal justice system. <clears throat> judicial solution, I, I shouldn't have said judicial solution. There's judicial involvement can be critical in a solution here. And that is via what um, many in the treatment realm would call assisted outpatient treatment. Here in Georgia, we call it involuntary outpatient treatment. And these are the statutes I've talked about who, that have been there for a long time. Kind of a middle ground between inpatient hospitalization and no connection to the court system at all. And the criteria is essentially a person who doesn't meet criteria for inpatient, but without structure is going to inevitably. But the court systems just have not utilized it to this point. And what this system can potentially do is integrate the probate courts with things like ACT teams or other treatment providers and kind of create a sense of accountability um, without having a person in a lockdown facility. And the 2022 Mental Health Parity Bill kind of lays the groundwork via grants and, and statutory language for utilization of these statutes and potentially could really make a difference in stemming the tide into the criminal justice system, kind of a stopgap to some extent. This is not mental health court in the sense that AOT does not or should not offer sanctions like jail time, community service, that sort of thing that, to remind the person where they don't want to go back to. This is really about meaningful help and just having the courts involved as a partner and not as a stick. And it's meant to foster access for individual to treatment team and to coordinate accountability with the court in a therapeutic way. <clears throat> so it provides courts a way to intervene prior to arrest and to put the focus on the individual's treatment and happiness and it helps put an end to this revolving door of inpatient hospitalization, kick them out on discharge without any real plan, wait for them to come back in, make money off them, kick them out, wait for them to come back in, it's a way to bring them into the fold, so to speak, and, and show them what real treatment really is. Because crisis stabilization is just a breath. It's to keep something worse from happening. And this is meant to foster growth on an outpatient basis. If y'all are interested in that potential solution, the Treatment Advocacy Center at treatmentadvocacycenter.org is a program uh, co-created with Dr. Xavier Amador who developed the LEAP approach to communicating with a client or a patient if you're a provider. Um, and they are on the forefront of developing assisted outpatient treatment. I just attended a conference of theirs a couple of weeks ago. Um, really good information and you know a real potential solution to, to this issue of the criminalization our folks with mental health challenges. I think I am over my time, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you all. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Oh, that's so pretty. Thanks. All right, one more round of applause for Derek Johnson Gage. Thank you. We are going to take a quick break before our next session. We'll be starting in this room at 1140. That gives you all about five minutes if you need to get up, use the restroom, get some more coffee, and we'll see you in here right at 1140. Thank you.
Test one. Keywords, just in case I go blank and forget my introduction or something.
Okay. Okay. So around 12:10, try and wrap it. Okay. I'll try and wrap. I saw it. I figured some of the panels must must have Q and A. So that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. It was my mom's. And for a second, I thought it was lost. I almost killed my kid because she she would wear it all the time. And I was like, you know, my mom gave that to me. And then I thought she lost it. I was like, it's one of the only things I have of hers. So, and I always get compliments on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Sarah. I'm Kamina. It's I nice to meet you. you. Uh, when did you come to Emory? 2016. Okay, I graduated in 2012. Oh. And so I knew I'd seen you around. Yeah. But then COVID happened, so it's Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, thank you for coming back and sitting on this panel and doing the doing the work of angels. Oh, well, I love it, and I also um, love it. All right, everybody, we're going to get started with our second session of the day. Yeah. All right, I am here to introduce our moderator for our second session on exploring mental, uh, mental health in civil law. Um, many of you know her. Many of you love her. She taught me what a contract is and made me cry the first week of 1L, <laughs> Professor Kamina Fender. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, first, let me be begin by saying how excited I am about the topic of this year's EPIC conference. I think that it is this conversation is long overdue. It's an ongoing conversation we need to have. And how much I appreciate EPIC for taking steps to destigmatize that conversation and bring awareness to the challenges that exist as related to um, mental health and how we can address them. So it is my pleasure to introduce our panel today. I'm just going to give their names, and then they are going to introduce their roles. Um, they are Ranim Ashrawi, Sarah Austin, and Sarah Kelsey. Both of the Sarahs are Emory alums, and I believe all three of you work for Legal Aid. Great. So I'm going to turn the mics over to you just so that you can tell the audience your, the specific roles and practice you engage in 
at Legal Aid. Great. Um, thank you. Um, and I'll start. My name is Sarah Austin. Um, as Professor, Professor uh, Pender said, I'm an a, a Emory alum from class of 2012. And I have been at Legal Aid since I was a 2L. Um, I showed up as an intern and kind of never left. And I work in the Decatur office, which is the DeKalb County General Law Unit. Um, as an office, we do all kinds of civil litigation, um, but I mostly do family law, representing people, many people surviving uh, family violence and escaping family violence, um, as well as just general family law. Um, so divorces, custody, um, legitimations, and all that. Um, and I really enjoy working with students as well. I work on the intern um, hiring and supervision committee, and I'm going to be moving into uh, supervising that program in the next year and love uh, supervising and mentoring interns in our office. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Renee Meshrawi. Um, I did not go to Emory. I went to UGA Law. Go dogs. Sorry, everyone here. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, I'm also an attorney, a staff attorney with Atlanta Legal Aid. I actually, um, at the time that the posters were created for this um, conference, I was an Equal Justice Works Fellow um, sponsored by Evershed Sutherland and the Home Depot. So I just spent the last two years of my career um, out of law school um, working on a project that I um, created and designed with my host, which was Atlanta Legal Aid, um, and uh, that my sponsors, you know, supported, um, where I was focused on youth um, access to mental health care. So that was primarily focused on um, all of our clients are low income and Medicaid eligible. So this was focusing on um, kids, teenagers, um, anyone under the age of 21 getting access to all the medically necessary mental health care services that they need um, in the community um, and then also in the school setting. So I did some special education and school discipline work. Um, as of Monday, I will be moving into a role with both the Sarahs um, in the Decatur office. So I'll be working with the DeCab general unit um, for a portion of my time, which means I'll be doing a host of civil legal work, as Sarah just described. But I'll also get to spend um, a quarter of my time kind of continuing my project. I'm in a really lucky position that my, my mentors in the administration have been really supportive of me continuing this youth mental health project. So I'll be working with the Disability Integration Project, which I'm sure this Sarah will tell you a little bit more about. But I'll get to kind of split my time between the two. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Kelsey. Uh, as Raneem said, I'm in the Disability Integration Project. I've been with Atlanta Legal Aid since my second year of practice, so coming up on uh, six years at Legal Aid. And for about four of those years, I was actually in the Home Defense Program doing something totally different, which was foreclosure defense and title issues and consumer scam stuff. Um, now I'm in DIP. And this unit is focused on um, enforcing the Olmstead decision, which is a Supreme Court case that was actually brought and won by Atlanta Legal Aid in the 90s. It's basically Brown versus Board of Education for people with disabilities. It says that the state cannot segregate people based on disability. So almost 30 years later, my work is um, working on helping people who are either institutionalized or at risk of being in an institutional setting, whether that's a hospital, a, you know, jail or prison, or a segregated school system, um, helping them access services at home and in the community so that they can be served in the community instead of in an institutional setting. Thank you. So now I have a question for you, and it's I'm particular, I, I was already interested in the answer, so I had prepared this beforehand, but after listening to Derek present, I recognize that it is really challenging when you are engaging with a client who might be experiencing or struggling with mental health issues. And my question is, because obviously as lawyers, you want to approach this with education, sensitivity, um, you know, certainly I'm ignorant about how to engage as a representative or an advocate on behalf of someone who might be experiencing or struggling with mental health issues. Is there any sort of training in which you engage to help you to represent clients who might be struggling with mental health issues? So I 
I had some training actually before I was at Legal Aid uh, when I was in the Lawyers for Equal Justice incubator program and it was uh, representing the pro bono client. And it focused quite a lot on representing people who are in crisis. I would say even if my client doesn't you know, meet clinical criteria, probably 95% of the clients that I've spoken with, including when I was doing housing work, at some point were in crisis when I was talking with them or working with them. Um, so that training covered things like understanding that when someone's in crisis, especially our clients who don't who start out not having a lot of resources much of the time, they are going to miss meetings. They're going to forget to turn things into. You have to cut them a little more slack than you might with other clients. Um, and uh, we also had a training that was really valuable, and I was actually thinking I should watch it again, that was um, kind of a trauma-informed approach to representing clients. It talked about um, different things people with different diagnoses might exhibit. Um, one thing I remember was avoiding eye contact came up quite a lot. Uh, it talked about, you know, whether we don't always know if our client has a diagnosis, but many people are coming to us with some kind of trauma in their background. And there were things like no, trying to notice what makes your client seem nervous, especially, um, you know, as attorneys, we don't seem very different than people from the systems that have harmed our clients. So um, just trying to... Um, whether it's things that seem obvious, like what tone of voice you use and, and being friendly and that kind of thing, but noticing or asking them, do they want the door open or closed, um, things like that. Yes, and I will um, you know, sort of piggyback on what Sarah Kelsey, was, the point she was making, that for many of our clients, uh, mental health struggles and diagnosis, whether they've been clinically diagnosed or not, is very intertwined with and interrelated with uh, trauma. And of course, for people who experience, you know, mental health issues in one way or another, diagnosed or not, it often compounds the trauma, the way that is received in the world, um, the treatment they receive. And for my clients in family law situations, often how it plays out within those legal crisis moments. Um, so for me, it, you know, as Sarah Kelsey said, there's, it's helpful to have the information of knowing, you know, if someone is struggling with something in particular, but I approach my work understanding that by definition, someone who is coming to legal aid for help with a family law situation is in crisis and in trauma. And in most cases, our clients, you know, lead lives of, you know, ongoing sort of generational and situational trauma. And that can lead to or exacerbate or trigger mental health crises in itself. Um, and so it, it's, sort of a terrible, vicious cycle in many cases. And so I basically approach every case as though that's part of the mix, because it usually is. Um, as far as training goes, you know, one downside of, um, you know, nonprofit practice is that we don't have like a lockstep hiring program where everyone comes in at once and gets a sort of standardized training. Mm -hmm. So you're training on the job. In many cases, people are coming in having had internships or externships in the field. I do think that we are very focused in interacting with um, both interns, externs, and new attorneys on helping people to become trauma-informed, disability-informed, and just conversant in what makes our client base special and what we need to do to meet people where they are and help them the best we can. And so that is something we address, you know, in our intern training, we talk about, you know, being trauma-informed and culturally competent around poverty issues, um, you know, mental health issues, all of the things that come into play for our clients. And it's something that I'm always eager to see us do more of, but I think we are as deliberate as we can be, and it's always part of our continuing education, you know, every year that we're doing sessions on mental health, on trauma-informed care, and so on. Um, I think it would be irresponsible of us to do the work we do without that. I think um, trauma, I mean, the, the training I think of is, is the kind of the trauma-informed training that the Sarahs, both Sarahs have mentioned. Um, but I think, you know, I've, I've attended, whether it was trauma-informed training when I was a, a 2L and an intern with Atlanta Legal Aid over the summer, um, or trainings that I've done that were offered through, like, continuing legal education, um, or just listening to other practitioners speak about what they've learned um, 
in terms of how to be a trauma-informed lawyer after a decade of practice, every time I attend one of these trainings that are focused on trauma-informed lawyering, I pick up something new and it's, I try not to be hard on myself that I didn't do this, this thing before because I don't think that there's any amount of um, training that you could kind of do off the bat without uh, real-world experience that will kind of give you everything you need to know. Um, so it's a kind of a combination of training and real life experience um, that ultimately means that you're going to have to make missteps along the way, which is, I mean, I always think about how unfor like, unfortunate that is that my last client maybe had to deal with me making a misstep of something where I wasn't as trauma informed as I could be. I think one example I've seen is making sure when we're asking questions where we're thinking really deliberately about why we're asking that question and what kind of information we need. Because um, sometimes, you know, when you're a lawyer, you want to know everything. You want all the information, so you're asking all the questions and kind of thinking through what is it that you need um, is really important. That's something I kind of learned in the last, like, six months, I would say, rather than in my first six months of practice. Um, and so I think the real-life experience, also kind of focusing some of us, like for me, um, knowing what it's like to be someone with a mental health diagnosis, I also focus on my own lived experience and what I would want someone to treat me like. Um, but I think those, those kind of trauma-informed trainings are a really big deal um, in terms of being engaged and being um, critical and introspective of yourself and your own practice in order to um, improve every step of the way. Thank you. Just to piggyback on that, because you say that you encounter clients who are both diagnosed and undiagnosed. And if you suspect, and you may or may not be aware when you are meeting with your client that a client is diagnosed, but if you suspect that there is some sort of, and I'm not sure how to say it since I can't say mental illness, um, if the client is struggling with mental health issues, how do you frame that, That's Derek? Good. That's a good one, I think. Okay. Right, of course, of course. But when thinking about it, so if you have a client who is struggling with these issues, is there a way that you can sensitively approach directing them towards resources of which they may not otherwise be aware without them feeling as though you're sort of taking away, and doing it in a way that so, so that they maintain their own autonomy and so that your counseling continues to be client-centered. One thing that's helpful for me when that comes up is that because my clients are typically dealing with disruptive and traumatic situations, I can, I can couch any um, you know, proposed help in terms of, you know, this is a stressful and difficult situation you're in, counseling could be helpful with that for you or for your children, um, you know, and generally speaking, someone who's escaping an abusive relationship or going through a custody battle, they're not going to receive the idea that they might want to talk to someone about that situation the same way that they would receive any suggestion that there might be, you know, a clinical diagnosis going on. Mm -hmm. And many of the same resources can assess those, those both needs in the same setting. And so, you know, I'm certainly not trying to mislead anyone, but if I point people toward resources for support that also may help them in, you know, gaining support around that specific issue, then, you know, my hope is that they're able to avail themselves of both and that, you know, I'm not a clinician, I'm not qualified to make that assessment, but if I suspect that some uh, mental health issue may be at play, that I can, you know, gently nudge them in that direction um, just for help with their practical concerns. And one, one help there is that a lot of the programs we often refer people to are kind of holistic in their approach. So I may be sending someone to an, an agency that can help with childcare, that can help with literacy services, that can help with, you know, any kind, all kinds of things. Um, and, you know, mental health services or support groups or therapy may be among those services. And so, people are more willing to receive that information in the context of, oh, you should reach out to families first, they do X, Y, and Z things, and this is just part of the holistic package. Um, I think it's, it's very interesting. The, my experience the last two years has been primarily because I'm working with youth who are, have unmet mental health needs, um, and their parents or their guardians are contacting me, contacting our office in 
seeking those needs. Um, a lot of my conversations end up being with the parent who may or may not have, I mean, I'm sure have their own trauma because of maybe the cycling, like cyclical experience of crisis, of their child going through a crisis, um, of their own experiences, whatever it is. But, you know, where I'm talking to a parent who, about their their child's unmet mental health needs, about their child's to them, sometimes it's their child's just their behavior. Um, they're, they're just acting up kind of thing. Um, a lot of what I've um, done is a lot of patience and relationship building because I don't think that anyone's going to receive information. Um, what I'm thinking about isn't necessarily resources, but almost a little bit more of like education and how we think about and talk about um, a child's unmet mental health needs. And so, you know, when a parent calls, I never right off the bat try to almost like correct their language of how they want to talk about their child. I think that's very important and it's not going to be received and then they might not even want to receive your legal help, let alone any other, you know, psychoeducation you want to provide. Um, but I think relationship building has been a huge um, source of uh, getting resources and information across. I've seen, you know, with families I've worked with where the mom may view the child's behavior as purposeful behavior and not related to a diagnosed mental illness, rather that it's just their the child is acting up, that they over time kind of un gain an understanding and maybe speak about their child's experiences and their own experiences differently. Um, and that just, for me, I think my role in that has just been slow relationship building and dropping nuggets of information and never trying to to push a narrative on on someone but to like offer it as a suggestion as an as an almost like an alternate as an alternate way of viewing whatever you're experiencing at that moment um and I've just found that I, I'm always I came I'm I'm still a baby attorney so I come in thinking that I can maybe fix all these things in a short period of time and then I feel maybe dejected that you know, in three months, this hasn't been done. But then when six months down the road, I notice a shift in language of how um, a parent is talking about their child or how a parent is even being introspective on their own um, needs, their own trauma needs, their own unmet mental health needs. Um, I can kind of see where that work is, is it's working, um, so. Yeah, so my, most people are coming to me because they want to be connected with resources, but we do have people who come to us and then don't follow up or change their minds. And um, something that was stressed to me in all of my training for doing both pro bono work and then when I came to legal aid, and I think it's part of our ethics training too, is you know client autonomy. What is the attorney's role? What is the attorney's job? And what is the client's decision? And so sometimes we just have to let it go and hope they come back to us sometimes. This is really more adult clients. Um, but I try to like basically without without being dishonest, I just try to talk it up as much as I can. And, t and a, you know, sometimes it's like, this will help you get something you want. Um, you know, for students, for example, like this will help you be more successful in school and then help you when you get to college, things like that. Um, and then also, I think lived experience was mentioned earlier. Some, when it seems appropriate, sometimes I will kind of bring that up, um, whether that is to uh, make a client feel more comfortable or to kind of fight the stigma. I, I have, you know, um, you know, mental health diagnoses as well as autism spectrum disorder, and so when it doesn't seem like it would, you know, derail the conversation, I might bring that up, and then, I'm like, you know, I'm autistic, and here we are in my law office, so it doesn't, you know, necessarily mean something terrible. Um, or just things I can specifically relate to with clients, like um, I get really overwhelmed by noise too. Would you like me to ask them to provide you with sensory aids? Or I find this situation. I understand, you know, crowds might be really anxiety provoking. Does that ha is that what's happening? I think that's where lived experience can be really helpful. Is we can, when clients don't always have the language, especially when their um, experiences have been downplayed or they've been kind of gaslit to not trust themselves, we can identify sometimes just like issue spotting a legal issue and say, um, is this what's happening? And kind of validate their experience and then, okay, do you want me to ask for whatever accommodation for you or resource? I mean, sometimes the practical assistance is 
the best first step to take without labeling or, you know, you know, obviously not diagnosis in our roles, but just saying, you know, it seems like you could use X, Y, Z. Okay, I have one more question before I open it up to questions from the audience. And this is a little bit broader, which is what do you see as some of the challenges with respect to the legal profession in general? Um, and their inability or maybe unwillingness at times to consider these issues when they are advocate, engaging with clients. I feel like we could go on and on. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's pausing. I have many thoughts on this. Go ahead. Well, I, I mean, I think one, one specific area I can talk about, and I think Legal Aid has done a really great job of um, specifically, is um, the concept of people needing guardians and conservators. Um, that's just one kind of <laughs> divot of of the law that I think is, in general, we've still got a long way to go, but at Legal Aid, we've done a really great job of creating um, policies around how we handle referrals that come in, um, because 99% of the time, people, uh, the, the person that is the proposed, they would call them the proposed ward for a guardianship or a conservatorship, don't actually need that level of autonomy and rights and, and status as an adult um, stripped from them. They need ho the home and community-based services, which is what the Disability Integration Project provides, or they need housing stability or whatever it is. And so um, I think that's a that's a huge area where we need a lot of work done. I, I, I have na navigated that. My mom had dementia, mm -hmm. and so I had, I was her conservator and guardian, and mm -hmm. I was just, I mean, navigating that system is not easy, yeah. even with my law degree. It was just, it was a lot. Yeah. So. I mean, and it's, yeah. you know, we, we see it with adults. We also see it with kids a lot. I want the kind of the role I was was in, um, I was situated with within our medical legal partnership. So where Legal Aid has a partnership with CHOA, actually, my office was just down the street from here. I'm in Georgia State University, and we would have a lot of, um, whether it would be doctors or teachers or even parents calling us because their kid is 17 turning 18, and their child might have like an ADHD diagnosis diagnosis or a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder or um, I don't know any any whatever you know run the gamut of diagnoses um, and they're being told well once your child turns 18 you will have no control or power or specifically ability to help and support your child they'll be on your their own in a school IEP meeting um, you won't be able to go to the doctor with them you won't have access to these records and parents are thinking well my kid is yes they're turning 18 and the law says that they're a legal adult now but they still need their help my help or and the the teenager also says you know my I still need my mom my mom or my dad's or my parents help um, and there's a lot of education that goes around we, it still requires a lot of education of doctors of parents of teachers of like that that's not true <laughs> it, there's not this wall that comes up when someone turns 18 or it doesn't have to be that way right maybe um, the default setting is that but there are ways to set up arrangements wherever people can um, have informed consent and agree to having someone involved in their care and part of their support system and part of a supported decision-making like ecosystem essentially so yeah I would say that uh, something we say in disability integration project and if you walk away from anything I want it to be these two words which is presume competence uh, my clients often have you know developmental disability or other diagnoses as well as mental health diagnoses so whatever the case is even if they have a guardian and conservator presume competence um, don't immediately question what somebody says. Um, one thing I remember from the trauma-informed training was that even if what someone says is improbable and probably not true, it's true to them. There's some element that is true, whether it's that someone made them uncomfortable, for example. Um, I guess on a different note, you know, one thing is what I always say a lot in my rant is that we have this profession where we've got a month or so where we talk about attorney wellness and we say, why is, why is there so much uh, you know, mental health challenges in the legal profession? And then we turn around and we use stigmatizing language um, to not go on and on about, <laughs> about it. I would say, if you're interested, just Google Lydia X Z Brown. They have a blog post that they started 10 years ago and just add on to that talks about language with ableist roots and what you can say instead. Like, please don't use mental health diagnoses as a shorthand for an insult. It's, it's very hurtful. <laughs> um, whether you're talking about other attorneys or clients or, or whatever, um, that's just, 
I'll stop talking because there's a lot. <laughs> Well, and one thing that I see often in my practice in family law, and that certainly this is a societal wider problem beyond the legal profession, is people, including attorneys, weaponizing uh, mental health diagnoses or any disability against people um, and treating it as a barrier to being able to function as a parent or a fully competent adult. Um, you know, I've had various family law cases in which mental health concerns either, you know, had already been part of the picture or arose as part of this traumatic crisis situation and, you know, became a big part of the discussion about what is best for this family, you know, what is what might be best for children involved in the situation in the long term. Um, you know, I've had a couple of, I've had two separate cases in which somebody had a postpartum mental health crisis and lost access to their children. And so, um, you know, in many of these cases, we are working with opposing counsel on the other side. I mean, in all cases, we're working with the bar and the bench more broadly. And there is an element of community education around helping people to, you know, as you said, assume competence, assume that with support, people can do what they need to do and, you know, parent their children and be in the world and not view these things as just an off-ramp for functioning and like, oh, clearly you can't step back into this role or, you know, it's appropriate for you to not have custody of your children or whatnot. Um, you know, taking a practical approach of helping people have the services they need to do what they need to do and do what they want to do. Um, but it, has, it is very challenging sometimes interacting with the private bar and sort of the, the flippancy with which people talk about mental health. I experience the same thing with people, you know, using terms in this, dismissive way or just dismissing a client or a situation because of the mental health angle. Um, and so it does feel like a, an uphill battle. But I do think that within some sectors of the legal community, and I think legal aid is one of them, there is a intersectional approach and sort of a ethos to looking at people's lives as a whole and looking at the ways in which their trauma and their current crisis and perhaps mental health diagnoses intersect and addressing what you can address in that situation rather than writing it off. Thank you. Are there any questions? There's a mic right in the center of the room. If any of you have any questions for our panelists, we have a little bit of time to take questions. Yes. you shared that you have a personal struggle with mental health issues, how do you maintain your own mental health when interacting with clients that may have situations similar to yours or that may have a triggering effect on your mental health? Um, therapy. <laughs> but I also <laughs> want to say that everyone, I mean, I think everyone in the, in the legal profession should be uh, seeking, I mean, th that doesn't just mean talk therapy, but just seeking therapeutic interventions. Um, I say that because even this is a, something I, I am battling, even not within the legal profession, just talking to other people. Sometimes when we say therapy, people assume we mean just talk, like talk therapy, psychotherapy, and there's lots of different therapeutic interventions, and talk therapy is not the the best thing or the most effective modality for ever, like for each person. So, um, I mean, it works, it's part of what works for me, but so maintaining a regular schedule um, with a therapist. Um, and then also, um, I'm still figuring it out because I'm in my first, my first couple years of law um, and it definitely did, did affect me a lot. Um, but I think figuring out how to compartmentalize an appropriate amount, um, not so much where you're just detached. I think this work, if you don't, if you stop caring, um, if you stop having any emotions, if you stop getting angry, you might you might not be in the right profession anymore because I feel like if you're not getting angry when you see the things that we see, um, that's a problem. But figuring out the appropriate amount of emotional response um, and when when to detach, um, figuring out boundaries for yourself, work whether that's work hour boundaries or um, how much you want to, you know, Sarah was talking about self-disclosure and when it's appropriate. You know, there are clients or there are situations where it feels appropriate to disclose um, my lived experience um, with the mental health system and there's times where it doesn't 
feel like there's a there's a benefit to it. So figuring out that type of boundary as well um, is is really important. But um, therapy above all. <laughs> yeah, I would say that therapy and uh, using our PTO. Um, it's like a joke how much I just escape into the woods <laughs> to, is, a, is my burnout prevention days. Um, and I think something that Raneem said too, you know, it not only is part of it, part of having those feelings is being effective, but also I notice when, whenever I start to feel a little numb, that's the sign that burnout is impending. So that means take a step back. I think it helps to ha ha be in a supportive work environment. Um, you know, the work I do is very hard and very sad, and but being with supportive colleagues is what makes it um, doable, and it helps to be able to talk to people, especially when you can disclose it at work. Um, for, you know, for me, what's triggering is when I see something bad said about a client that could be said about me too. So, and there are times when I'm like, whatever, ableism in the profession, who cares? But then there's times where I'm like, that really is hurtful. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have a good answer, it's just kind of. Yeah, and as I'm the only one who has it self-disclosed so far, I am also, you know, a neurodiverse person. You know, I, am, I have ADHD and anxiety and I'm pretty open about that in my work, um, with my colleagues at least, not necessarily with clients, except as Sarah said, when it feels appropriate to self-disclose. Um, I would say like cultivating a community both in your professional world, like I am very glad that Legal Aid is a place where I don't feel um, that I'm going to have my mental health, you know, weaponized against me professionally, um, that like my supervisor and my colleagues know this about me and that I don't feel um, self-conscious about having, you know, crochet. I used to crochet in meetings because it helped me focus to have something I was doing with my hands and that was fine. Um, I have fidget spinners on my desk for similar reasons. So having things like that, there's these small everyday tools that are not stigmatized that my colleagues, you know, for the most part know why they're there and it's just part of the overall picture and that's fine. Um, I've been very happy to be in a work setting where that is the case and I think if I were ever to move, um, I would be looking for a community where neurodiversity is actively part of the conversation and not um, something that I feel like I constantly need to reassert. Um, and also just having a supportive community outside of the office of friends and colleagues you can talk to about these things. You know, I have friends from law school, um, friends from the practice, family members who I can, you know, talk through these situations with, um, you know, even when it's a stressful client situation where I'm not going to go into any identifying detail, I can go to my partner and say, you know, I had a really stressful case today and I'm feeling super anxious and on edge. And he knows what that means. And having, you know, surrounding myself both professionally and personally with people who know how, the, how those things interact for me has been incredibly helpful. And just so that we're unanimous on this, therapy. Therapy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for both your participation and vulnerability today. Welcome. I, I also think that it benefits everyone and it benefits the legal community for lawyers to, when they're comfortable, be open about that. And so, you know, I'm not going to make that call for anybody else, but I'm glad that we're all able to share that. Uh, hi, I had a question mostly for Sarah Austin. Um, I was, uh, you're talking about your practice in family law, and yep. I was thinking that you mentioned it a little bit that attacks on your clients or other people's. Um, diagnoses and mental illnesses can be pr probably really salient for opposing counsel um, and how much I want to know how you approach that how much of that can you do you think can be solved by education in the industry at large or just really effective advocacy and um, how how do you balance that with the uh, clients privacy interests absolutely um, and this comes up a lot as you can imagine um, where a client has or may have some mental health situation that's interacting with their case. Um, I think that being a zealous advocate and being an advocate for mental health education are not usually um, mutually exclusive in a given case. Certainly if a client does not want me to, uh, to disclose medical information, I'm going to respect that and honor their privacy. But in most cases, I am able to gear my response and my ad advocacy for my client around functional, practical concerns. So if someone, if an opposing counsel comes to me and says, 
well, I don't think your client should have overnight visitation with the kids because of X, Y, and Z concerns. I turn that not from, not to what, what's the diagnosis or what's, you know, the level of, sort of the label of functioning we're going with here, but like what, practically speaking, are your concerns? Are you concerned about substance use? Are you concerned about, you know, judgment and decision making? What practical solution is there for that problem, you know, regardless of whether it stems from a mental health diagnosis or, you know, addiction, trauma, whatever it might be. Um, and so often I'm able to advocate for my clients around, you know, how do we solve a practical concern without, you know, disclosing personal information they might not want to disclose or, you know, sharing their treatment, um, you know, details of what they may be, you know, working with in treatment around uh, diagnosis, um, but advocating for the practical outcome that they're looking for. And I feel like I keep coming back to sort of practical solutions, but like a lot of times I do see opposing counsel and to some extent the bar, or the bench rather, treating these things as sort of a foregone conclusion, like, oh, this person has a diagnosis of such and such, is that inherently a drawback or like a, a bad fact on their custody case? Well, is it the diagnosis or is it the practical concern? You know, plenty of people, myself included, parent effectively and wonderfully with a mental health condition and, you know, look at like, what does this person, you know, what is your immediate concern? How can we address that? Um, and how can I, as an attorney, support my client in accessing whatever support they might need to parent or care for themselves effectively? Thank you for your time. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, so I think we're, we're about at time. Thank you so much for this really informative panel. As a law student, it's always really great to hear from practicing lawyers and think about things that I can take with me into my practice one day. So thank you so much for coming today and sharing your experience with us. Thanks for having us. Everybody else, um, we ask that you be back by one, but you are free for lunch. <laughs>